Patagonia. So we get started? Yes? Sure. Let's go. So, my name is Nicolas Lucas. I am conservation manager for the Nature Conservancy in Argentina. Yes. Our program in Argentina involves Patagonia and increasingly so the Pampas and the Greater Chaco, which are other local regions of, the, of my country. Uh, very glad to have the opportunity to be here to visit the land of the Wizard of Oz. We don't want to come to Kansas. <laughs> Um, but more than that, to share with you uh, the impressions and information about the land I love, no? land I love by adoption. No? I wasn't born there, I was born in Buenos Aires, the capital of Argentina, but I lived in Tierra Fuego many years, yes, um, and that's because I am married to Patagonia, yes, my wife is from there, she's a native from Patagonia, which is a rare thing to have, because there's a lot of migration there, those are my children who the red devil there is now this high. <laughs> this is when they were growing up in that part of the world. And very happy, as you can see, and that is not just a picture of the, the, the experience of living there. We lived many years in Tierra del Fuego, which is the bottom tip of Patagonia. Yes, the last stop before Antarctica. Yes, that's where we, she comes from and where I <coughs> learned to love this geography. At one point in my life, in my previous life, I was the Minister for Natural Resources of the province, so I got to know uh, its realities, uh, economic, social, and uh, environmental realities very deeply. So I want to share some of that uh, with you. And now that I move back to, to Buenos Aires, it's when you realize how much you like that place, no? I wanted to show you a reflection from Charles Darwin, right? Which is one of the illustrious visitors we had <coughs> that part of the world, yes. In the voyage of the Beagle, which you may recall, he, you know, he toured the world, basically. And writing his memoirs in, at the end of his life is what he said, no? He like, it's in the tropics that most vividly are represented in his mind, but it is the sublimity of Patagonia that made a mark in his, in, in his mind, no? And that is true, except for this. Uh, Patagonia is not a desert, <laughs> yes? Mm -hmm. Looking at the places where Darwin landed and visited and, and, and was, you can tell why he would call it a desert, because it's the most arid parts of the region, but it's actually not. No? But it is a very sublime place, it's a place where, at least for me, I can get the mountains and the forests and the oceans. You know, people connect to different kinds of landscapes or nature. I connect with this kind of the grasslands, uh, the pampas, but especially the Patagonia, yes? It's a, it's a place where at least for me, my soul makes a connection. So before going deeper into uh, Patagonia itself, let me provide you a little bit of context, which at least I find useful to, for interpreting what is going on in that part of the world. This is how I like to see the world, no? at least in my mind. It's a patchwork, colorful patchwork of diverse places with each with its own characteristics. This is a map by WWF with all the regions of the world. Yes, we are this part here. Yeah. Very distinct, very special, right there. This, which you have seen probably, is more of the reality, no? It's not really like that. I mean, the human footprint is really visible and ecosystems have changed a lot, no? And they have become more homogeneous across the world. But then, the good news at least, within that context, and it's not necessarily bad, but it does have an impact on nature. It's transformed nature a lot. You have dark spots here, here, in Mongolia, in Siberia. There are places in the world where that footprint is still not that visible, no? And Patagonia is one of those, right? It's one of those places where you still have a low population density with a level of development that is still, um, you know, in time to do things right and not to. Of course, the situation is not perfect. I will tell you what problems we have in a minute, right? <coughs> but just to locate yourselves in relation to where we are now, those are the tall grass prairies now in the United States. This is where we are. Please note that the map contains the Pampas as well, which is the other large grassland in my country. Yeah, it's a paint area over there. But Patagonia, as you see, is there. If you were to overlap one with it, this is where we are, no? in hills. If you overlapped Patagonia, it would look something like that. Just to give you a sense of the dimensions of uh, 
this part of the world, right? It's mm -hmm. around 800,000 square kilometers. I wouldn't know how to translate it to miles, but I think you multiply tens 1.5 or something like that, and you get the surface in uh, miles. We more or less share the same latitudes, more or less. No? Patagonia goes from the 30s latitude to 50 something no? in the south. Tall grasses go more or less from the 30s to the 40s, more or less latitude. Mm -hmm. Yes, we're very close to Antarctica. Mm -hmm. And that is one defining feature I want to talk about. You see? Two or three things we go before going more into, into detail. Notice the ice. This was taken in the fall, I think, probably closer to the winter. Yeah. But much of it, especially here, are glaciers. No? Lots of ice in Patagonia. Of course, they less and less as you go north because of the temperature, of course. Uh, but a lot of ice. But more importantly, in terms of understanding the dynamics there, the essential of nature is water and water. Yes? Mm -hmm. Tallgrass prairies is landlocked. You have land and land. In, in, in Patagonia, no. We are a triangle in, in, the, in the ocean. No? And that determines a lot of what happens with the weather and therefore with the temperature and therefore with rainfall and vegetation, etc., etc. So it's very important to understand this uh, location. And the other thing important to note is we are the last stop before Antarctica. Mm -hmm. yeah? Very close to Antarctica. Right? And again, that does have an, uh, an impact, a definition, on what happens in the other area. So, let me, while I present some facts, show you some images of what this place looks like. Yeah. So, these are pictures of different regions, but I want to know it's not homogeneous. You have different sub-regions within that place, especially the step, the, the grasslands are Include the steppe and the shrublands, and then proper grasslands in the more humid areas where you have a lot of water. No? Um, the average temperature in Patagonia, annual average temperature for the whole region, is about 15 degrees Celsius, which is more or less what you probably have here. But because we are so influenced by the, the ocean, the differences in temperature are not as high as here. No? So if you go north, of course, it gets very cold in winter. And in summer, you do get some warm weather. No, you, get, you even get beach warm weather. And there, there's some nice beaches on the coast of Patagonia, where you can get in the sea, very cold water, mind you. Uh, but then if you go further down south in, uh, in the region, uh, there's no way you would even wear short trousers no, in summer. No, like in Tierra del Fuego, you would wear um, warm clothes year round. right? So it's cold all year. Um, it is an arid, semi-arid, sub-humid region, so rainfall is somewhere between, depending on location, 200 millimeters and 600 millimeters, more or less. I think over here it's about more like 900 or so, yeah? Average for the whole region, depending where you go. It's get wetter as you go to the, towards the mountains, no? Because the dynamic there is the wind, the prevailing winds come from the Pacific Ocean, from the west. So the humidity rises, the wind blows, the humidity precipitates a lot on the Chilean side, and you get those wonderful lush forests you have on the Chilean side of the Cordillera de los Andes. And then some water comes across and precipitates on the Argentinian side, but then it, the, the, the decrease in rainfall is very sharp as you move into the steppe. No? And then increases again as you get closer to the Atlantic Ocean. No? So it goes from 200 back to 600 or so. Okay? So it's tends to be arid. And that has, a, of course, a natural implication, which is it's a relatively fragile environment. No? And I'm going to go back to that in a, in a second. And not only arid and um, relatively cold, but the wind, no? relentless. It's really, really a defining factor or a feature for that region. It blows almost constantly. We're all very happy whenever it stops blowing, yes? Um, <laughs> And which is every now and then. Fortunately, it subsides in the winter. Thank God. No. <laughs> we don't have tornadoes. <laughs> no. But we do have gusts and, 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 and days when the wind can go 70, 80, 100 and above. Children miss classes because of the wind, not because of the snow mostly. Yeah. 
uh, in some parts, in other parts, it's, it's, it's uh, easier. But it is clearly, the, the average for the whole region annual is like 40 kilometers per hour, which doesn't sound too impressive, but it's, it's constant, you know, it's all the time. Uh, it's about 25 miles, more or less, per hour. Right? But then it can get really, really serious. And on top of that, uh, the volcanoes, yes? We are close to the Andes. Uh, the Andes has a volcano, chain of volcano and a subduction zone, you know, so there are all active volcanoes all over the place, and, you know, it's been like that forever, will be like that forever, and we haven't really learned how to adjust to that condition. In the last 10 years or so, we've had three major eruptions of volcanoes, and, you know, there's some pictures here of some volcano. You can see the plume normally coming out of the the other side of the Cordillera, but because the wind blows from the Pacific into Argentina, we get all the ashes coming over to us, uh, which creates you know, a month of inconvenience, but then remains there forever, for very long periods of time, mm -hmm. until the soil absorbs and everything comes back to normal. Each eruption is a serious problem. No? Mm -hmm. It's a serious problem for farmers too, because they, it's not so much that they um, Animals uh, cannot eat because of the uh, layer of ashes, but it's that the, the animals lose their teeth. You know? mm -hmm. they, they eat with ashes and, you know, and they grind mm -hmm. and they start losing and then they can't eat anymore. No? Mm -hmm. It's a real problem. And we have, there are people in the area developing like prosthetic. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you, know, they can, you can do it cheaply. It's a region with a relatively low biodiversity. I don't know if you heard our friend from, from Brazil or from other places. I mean, nothing like that, you know, even for a grassroot. No? Um, the, the Conservancy did a number of years ago a study of priority areas for conservation, and we identified 18 mammals, 27 bird species, which is relatively low. No? Nice, but it's not a hot spot of biodiversity, that's for sure, no? not the desert but certainly on the lower side. Mammals, charismatic mammals, uh, you will see some of them here. We have the puma and the guanaco, you know, the guanaco is a camel, is like, a, like a llama, right? But more graceful, more beautiful. <laughs> um, they, they roam yeah, all over the region. They are protected species and their numbers are growing, so farmers are getting nervous. No? They compete with the uh, sheep. No? Uh, they also know about the pumas whole conversation with them about how do you deal with them. It's not a question of uh, going extinct with, uh, with that animal, but trying to find a way to, to coexist. Um, a number of invasive species, of course, in the, in the region, which uh, some of them, many of those uh, associated with degraded soils, yes, so there is an interesting thing where if you do poor grazing of your soil, you don't only degrade your soils, but you also encourage invasive weed species, yes, which are an indicator of that. We have uh, seen, or our partners have seen on the ground places where good grazing practices generate the natural grasslands, and then they, uh, they move aside the invasive species, which is an interesting thing, you know, how you can, uh, the invasive doesn't compete with the local, at least for some species which are not eaten by I see. No? Um, <clears throat> we have almost no agriculture in Patagonia. Yes, so that's one pressure we do not have. Uh, very interesting, lots of ranching. There is some in the northern part, yes, where irrigation is possible. That was the end. Maybe I, I, go, I can go back. <coughs> well, <coughs> I'll be more disturbing going back than continue. Um, so that's one pressure we do not have. There's a lot of pressure from from ranching, but not from agriculture. For now, no. Sooner or later, drought-resistant seeds will be developed that will have shorter cycles and will be probably able to grow in parts of the, of the region. No, but not now. I, I, I was. I remember when I was secretary for environment of the province of Tierra del Fuego in the south, which I was for a number of years. They came with a proposal to do some testing for a dwarf kind of maize of corn to test it out in Tierra del Fuego. They said the soil is it's all right. We think the weather can work out and the daylight is enough for a short cycle. Um, 
And as an authority, we had we really struggled with that. No, no, what, what do you do with a proposition like that? Do you say yes and provide another source of revenue for farmers? Uh, or you act precociously and say no? And we ended up saying no. no? Uh, we said we'd rather work with farmers on improving their grazing and making sure that uh, ranching is properly done and provides for a livelihood and a uh, good uh, economy rather than experiment with some new seed who, who knows what will lead to no? Anyway, that is one, one pressure we don't have. Almost all of Patagonia is privately held, 98%, mm -hmm. which of course means that any conservation activity or plan needs to engage with the private sector, um, not only farmers, uh, and farming as an activity, as an economic activity in Patagonia is tiny. I mean, it is really a small fraction of the economy what goes through uh, farms. But in terms of conservation, it's all the difference because they, they control almost all of the land. Farms, no? So one needs to work with them in a small uh, economic niche. The other big players that affect the territory, and uh, they do have a very significant economic uh, participation, is the oil and extractive industries. No? Oil, gas, and mining, right? Actually, Patagonia has uh, the second largest uh, shale gas deposit in the world. No? So there's a big expectation that that will you know, create a source of wealth for the country, located in, 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 okay, no? in the northern part of Patagonia, and part of it like over here, and part of it here, another reservoir here in the province of Chubut. Uh, but that is an economic player of significance. No? They represent something like 25% of the economy or so. Right? And the other major players in the economy are um, services and tourism, associated to tourism a lot, they, they move a lot. Fisheries, a little bit, no? not that big. And the state, state presence. Because there is an active policy from the national, the federal authorities to populate this region since the early 20th century or so, with a very strong emphasis since the 1980s, no? with special regimes that would promote uh, migration and so forth, but part of that is providing jobs for people and part of that is in governmental structures, no? municipal, provincial, etc. So the economy of the province, of the region, is basically governed by state presence, by the oil, uh, gas and mining, and by tourism and services associated with it, and the rest play a relatively minor role, no? which is uh, I will tell you in a minute, interesting for us. Um, so, let me tell you a little bit about the challenges, no? the, the problems we face in Patagonia, and what the Conservancy is doing about that. that Number one, and in our mind, probably the largest, is uh, land degradation, soil erosion. Yes, you have. The, the, the key in this map is, I'm sorry, it's in Spanish, but it means that the lighter the color, the better the state of soils, the darker the color, the worse. So this would be extremely desertified. Yes? So you have a serious problem of soil erosion, soil loss, and desertification in Patagonia uh, as a result of years and years, a century, I would say, or more, of poor grazing practices. No? There hasn't been uh, an awareness among uh, sheep growers that they were not, they were overloading uh, the fields, yes, the, the farms, and in the longer run, we get to this point where it is now a serious problem, and the producers themselves, they acknowledge, no? they clearly understand it, they see it every day, so that's one major challenge we face there. No? Um, the other is um, the extractive industries, oil, gas, and mine. You know? They do have a very strong impact on the landscape, yes? More focalized, not as widespread as grazing, you know? the sheep go all over the place. The extractive industries focus on areas, <coughs> but those areas can be very big, and they can have a serious impact. So um, when we, the Conservancy began to define a strategy for Argentina about 10 years ago, a little bit less, yes. We did a, a mapping of first uh, protected areas in the region, 
we found that the grasslands were underrepresented as uh, in terms of protection, yes. Uh, we started identifying, well, do those, wh where are the high priority conservation areas, you know, in terms of uh, the high biodiversity, relatively high biodiversity in Patagonia, we located them over here, there's some overlap here, but generally the high priority conservation areas are not well protected. No? Then we said, okay, so since 98% of the land is privately held in Patagonia, we need to work with farmers, so we identify a network, we, we came across an existing network of farmers engaged in sustainable grazing practices. No? And the concept there is that you can regenerate degraded soils and land and grasslands with production. No? Not taking away the animals, but leaving them there grazing, because that's a natural thing that to happen, as long as you do it correctly. So there are methods, no? technical methods, that say, okay, this is uh, the way you, you need to do a sheep grazing in order to regenerate your grasslands. So we partnered with them. These are the farms that are part of that regenerative network in the region, yes, um, and you know, found out that they were widespread, so working with that network would be a way of reaching a nice scale of conservation and regeneration in a geography with very few protected areas, yes. We also mapped oil industry, main places, no, there's more than this, but these are the main ones, and a river basin, these are the shale deposits I was talking about. This is the most productive, this is the second one, this is probably not going to go into production anytime soon. And then we mapped the, some river basins, especially important, no? for conservation. And based on that analysis, we began deploying our conservation strategy for uh, Patagonia. So, basically what we are doing there is three things. No? We are working on sustainable grazing with this network that I told you in partnership with uh, the company Patagonia Inc. I don't know if you know it, it's, uh, they produce uh, clothes. Yes. Very interesting company. No? They are very serious about conservation and environment. So um, the Nature Conservancy, Patagonia, and this network of farmers, they came to an agreement to whereby Patagonia would source wool from these farms uh, the, 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 the farms would certify that the wool is appropriately produced and obtained. The Nature Conservancy contributes science and uh, bringing together all the pieces, right? And that has been going on for a number of years. We're now reaching a stage where that needs to go to scale to be really effective. No? Because we don't need one company doing that, but many companies doing that, yes? Mm -hmm. To send a clear market signal to farmers, telling them that this is not only good for, for your soil, and you have conservation, it's good business as well, no? So we're now figuring out that. But it's been a very, uh, very interesting project going on. The second thing is we're working with oil companies, trying to figure out with them how their intervention in the territory can be done smartly. Now, it's not about saying no to oil and no to mining. Other NGOs do that, yes, and uh, we're friends with them as well. So, but our uh, mission here is to work with them and try to get them to do what they need to do. The problem there is there is no legal obligation for companies to do what we call the mitigation hierarchy. That is, if you're going to come into a, a place to explore and exploit, first, you need to avoid as much damage as technically possible. Also avoid it. Second, you need to minimize whatever damage you're going to cause. So you need to apply the best technology so you minimize your impact. And third, because there will be impact, Inevitably, because in the extractive industry, you need to compensate that impact and find ways of reinvesting part of the revenue from extracting those resources in a place where you can regenerate nature and regenerate natural capital. So we're working with companies on along those lines. Now, with moderate success there, it's a harder not to crack than farmers, incredibly, yeah, but they are. And the third one is uh, we're working on mapping ecosystem services in river basins, the ones here, here, and here. Now I'm trying to understand how that landscape works in terms of how it affects water supply. Yes, and we're doing that with a number of scientists in 
We're also doing two more things, more specific, yes? We're working on conservation easements. In, uh, we, it's a new concept for Argentina, something very common here that the conservancy has done forever, yes? And we find it's a very interesting tool to implement conservation in private lands. So we are just about to establish the first conservation easement in Patagonia, yes? Let me see if I can go back and show you. Here, over here, no? which is functional to a protected area, close to high priority conservation areas, so it's a nice location. But then, we are about to acquire, this close to acquire, the first property in Argentina. Conservancy is close to doing that, no? They do a tata lot in the US, in Argentina, this would be the first one. This would be a donation by um, a North American, a person from Colorado who, well, as you know the story, said I'd rather give this to the conservancy than sell it out. Yes, so we are about this close. Once that is done, and this is located like in northern, actually it's like here, in northern Patagonia, close to a city called Bariloche. People who have been around may recognize the name, Sarial City in, in Patagonia. Very well located. In a high priority for conservation area, this is the farm within a natural reserve. No, so it's perfect. We're about to, to get acquired. And then once the, the conservancy is in charge, the idea is not so much to have a preserve, no, but to have a demonstration site for sustainable grazing. No? So we want to show that the proposition that you can uh, have an income while doing good for the environment is viable. No? So that's, that's our idea. And on top of that, we, we would like to have the kind of thing you see here, right? A lot of research going on, interaction with university, with students who can coexist very well with uh, production. You know? So right. So that is, in general terms, Patagonia, yes? A very special place again, going back to the beginning, no? Because at the end of the day, an organization such as the Nature Conservancy has to ask itself why devote efforts to conserve a place like Patagonia. And the answer I come I, I, I keep reaching to is it's not so much because it is a place where you have globally significant biodiversity, we don't globally significant ecosystem services like capture, uh, carbon sinks, we don't, there, there is some of that, but not really, or globally significant natural resources, you know, the, for the world's producers of wool, no, Australia is, we're a small player in that game, same thing with fisheries, same thing with so many natural resources. So at the end of the day, the rationale, the, the most important rationale has to do with what Darwin was saying, no, it is a limited place. But the one is one of those corners of the world that if we lose, we lose as a humanity as a whole. No? And there are many of those places in the world, right? So our conservation efforts, while they use um, the industry, the grazing, the, all the utilitarian tools that we can reach and in partnership with the economic uh, stakeholders, the ultimate reason why we are doing work there is because it is a special place. Right? It's a very, very special place. It would be a real shame for the world to lose it as we are losing it with uh, land degradation and all of the uh, problems that I just told. So that is my panorama in Patagonia. And we have, yeah, we have some time to talk. If you have any questions or comments, happy to answer. Yeah. Approaches do you use to work with the communities and the stakeholders in, the, in these ranches? Yeah, technical. I mean, if, if I understand your, your question, I mean, land is largely privately held, yes, not by communities, but by individuals, okay. yes. Um, and farms tend to be medium to large. There are some smaller farms, especially mm -hmm. with the uh, mm -hmm. A map so I can. It small uh, land holding becomes smaller as you move here, further up north. Yes, 
but we focus on the larger ones because we're more interested in the large scale impact, uh, both for conservation and in terms of the problem, right? So when we approach farmers for this, it is through the awareness that they have a problem, they generally agree that they have a problem, really have to keep, they don't want to agree that they have a problem, but they have a problem, yes. I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't mention one other important thing, and that is climate change. You know? And uh, adjusting and adapting to the variability, and models are saying that uh, the, the region will become drier, it's especially here, less so here. You know? Here is ambiguous, probably not. Uh, but adapting to the, the, the variabilities that we are seeing lately is a big, big challenge, and farmers are well aware of that. Uh, even if we don't frame it as an issue of climate change. There is a real, very concrete issue that something is going on, or at least we're seeing things that they weren't prepared to cope with. Um, and we try to approach, uh, bring to them technical solutions. The same look. Can we agree we have a problem? Yes, we generally agree. Okay, let me help you understand now the economic implications of changing the way you do things and offering you a market solution because we're not telling people to close down the farm and turn it into a protected area. No, we're telling them stay there and, and work with you. No? But let's figure out a way where both things can be done simultaneously. So that is with, uh, with the farmer side. The oil companies is a completely different game. No? But um, in terms of farming, that's the approach. Did they get compensated for implementing these mismanagement practices? Yes. Patagonia has paid um, premium on price for that rule, and that has helped a lot. But then, that's why we need to go into scale, because Patagonia can buy as much wood. You know, they, they need you know, a fraction of what is actually produced, and we need a much larger demand for that wool. And then once you get to scale, probably that kind of premium for price may not be necessary. No? That's when you have a stable circuit, right? But we are trying to figure that out precisely at this stage. Yeah. Uh, in addition to oil, gas, and those industries, yeah. is there a threat from industrial wind? Industrial? I mean, industrial wind turbine complexes? Oh, OK. Um, we do not, I mean, there is there's a small development of wind turbines, which is a shame because there should be much more because the energy, you know, wind energy is so uh, available there. So there's not a real problem yet with those developments. But we have been approached by the government of this province here, you know, and they, they, they told us because we have a relationship from, for, for other things, for oil. They said, look, it's very interesting your approach to how to do smart oil extract, etc. Can we apply that to a wind farm that we're planning? I can't remember the location, but I think it's like, like over here. You know? um, and we said, yes, of course, because our approach is not strictly for oil and gas, it's for the landscape. You know? So the question is not so much how you do oil and gas uh, without damage or without minimum damage and a compensated damage but about how you go about your operation so that you minimize it, that you avoid, et cetera, et cetera. You know? So um, there is no, really not a big wind energy industry developed in the region, but it's slowly but steadily increasing. And uh, the main stake player here is this province here, and we have a, we're working with them precisely on that. You know? We have elections in October, so who knows? You know, maybe the next guys will say, you know? but. Yeah. In the areas of the largest soil degradation, if you turn it to sustainable practices, how long would it take for that soil to ha. recover? Question of the million. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Um, the estimate, the optimistic estimate of our partners who are working in the network, they say depending on the area, three to five years, mm -hmm. which I find too optimistic. Yes, mm -hmm. but. I have no, no position to argue with them. So what we're doing now, because we want to believe them, but we want to verify, yes, we are starting to develop the system, the monitoring system that will allow us as a conservancy to independently monitor, yes. But um, what they say is 
depending where it doesn't take that long. In other places, and go back to the map of the sun erosion, there are places where this cannot be done, or it can be done, depending on the level of erosion, it will take longer. You know? But uh, I would say an optimist would say five years. I would say it's more like 50. Is it more like rotating the land, or is that the sole practice, or are they doing yeah. other things as well? Yes, yes. Well, th th there is. Uh, a, a better understanding of your farm, of what you have inside your farm, and where to protect what, what uh, load so different right. places ad admit. But then it is a system that requires you to be very much on top of the sheep. You know, it's not like you let them go and then check on them, you know, every, every now and then. You need to be very aware of what is going on and move them in time. It's, it's not an easy system. How much of a role, if, if well, it plays a role, I presume, but what, to, to what extent is the government helping to reinforce or incentivize or support some of these practices mm -hmm. in the integration of them, even considering that most of the land is privately held? Excuse me, Mr. Oh, thank you. Oh, no, it wasn't. Really, sorry. Good. Well, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you didn't like my question. <laughs> No, unfortunately not not great, yes. Uh, like everything, there's a bit of everything, but in general terms, I don't think the, the, the general policy is designed as to address these kind of issues. On the contrary, when you look at the way the different incentives are laid out, economic and fiscal, incentives are laid out, they all kind of lead the producer, the farmer, into over exploitation. Taxes, uh, restrictions to trade, uh, no? And when we've had policies to address the sheep problem, because we had a very sharp